All Hallows' Eve, 1517. The Castle Church, Wittenberg, Northern Germany. Martin Luther has nailed one document to its door. The 95 Theses, 95 stinging attacks on the mighty Catholic Church. And its head, the Pope. Luther has no idea that with this one gesture, he has unleashed a hurricane. A storm of violence that will rage across Europe. Change the face of Western civilization forever. And sweep him towards an epic confrontation with the greatest powers of the day. God knows, I never thought of going so far as I did. I would never have thought that such a storm would rise from Rome over one simple scrap of paper. Luther had never intended for his 95 theses to create the tumult they did. But in Rome, the headquarters of the Catholic Church, they caused outrage and horror. Not just because they criticized the Pope, but also because they were massively popular. The theses touch a nerve for several reasons. Issues of moment to a large number of people at the time about uh, the church and its relationship in the economy, what is salvation, what do people have to do to be saved. And it's that combination in a time when people were really resenting the way in which the church was taking advantage of that desire to be saved. All that came together and made these something that people talked about. But the church had a name for works like this. They were heresy. And heresy called for a swift response. The first victims were Luther's books. And the next would be Luther himself. The ultimate punishment for a heretic was that they could be cut off from the church and handed over to lay justice, which would sentence them to death in a rather hypocritical phrase that they used, without the shedding of blood, which usually meant burning or drowning. Only a hundred years before, a man named Hus had criticized the church for much the same reasons as Luther. Hus was promised a safe hearing, only to then be roasted alive. The papacy can crush, That's, there's no two ways about it. It's an amazingly efficient machine for detection of error through the Inquisition, for example, and through the elimination of individuals. We have to say that Luther has entered an arena of extremely high gladiatorial risk uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a strong possibility of execution.
For Martin Luther, the mounting fury of the Catholic Church would inspire not doubt and fear, but an extraordinary courage that would only grow stronger with every attack he faced. There's no doubt that Luther is frightened by some of the threats that are made against him. But alongside this is this very strong idea that if the Christian life is being lived authentically, then you must expect to suffer. Luther sees the criticism of him almost as a confirmation of his vocation as a reformer. Martin Luther continues right on because he's a man of both high idealism, resolve, and naivete. One has to admire that kind of single-minded pursuit of an ideal. Luther squared up to the church with a style of opposition it had never encountered before. He was utterly dismissive of its threats. The Pope demanded that Luther disown the 95 Theses. Luther refused. The Pope sent a cardinal to interrogate him. Luther was unimpressed. He is no more fitted to handle the case than an ass to play on a harp. And then Luther was charged with heresy. He remained defiant. I demand they show me absolutely, not respectively, distinctly and not confusedly, certainly and not probably, just what is heretical. I think the difficulty the church faced was this. The more it tried to silence Luther, the greater Luther became convinced that he had a vocation which needed to be seen through. I desired to believe freely and to be a slave to the authority of no one, whether council, university, or pope. And I was bound not only to assert the truth, but to defend it with my blood and death. In Rome, Luther's writings were causing mounting fury. Pope Leo X now turned to the mightiest weapon in his arsenal excommunication. With this, Leo could condemn Luther to an eternity of hell in the next world and to make him an outcast in this. To the average Christian, papal excommunication meant that if you died without being reconciled to the church, you spent eternity in hellish torment. The document was drafted at Leo's magnificent hunting lodge outside Rome, and the text reflected the pontiff's favorite leisure pursuit, the stalking of wild boar. Arise, O Lord, protect yourself, for a wild boar of the forest is seeking to destroy your vineyard. We must proceed against this Martin Luther to his condemnation and damnation as one whose faith is notoriously suspect and is, in fact, a true heretic. Sealed with the great papal emblem of the crossed keys of St. Peter, this document should have sealed Luther's fate, not least because it could place him open to arrest by any secular or church authority. But as Leo was raising the stakes in Rome, Luther was discovering that he had a new and powerful weapon on his side. For movements to spread, their ideas need to spread. And for Luther, it was providential that a means of disseminating these ideas had suddenly become available through the printing press. I think in our own day and age, we're very much aware of how much 
things have been changed by the internet. What the internet is to our day, printing was to Luther's day. It meant the ideas could travel. They could not be stopped. Luther had watched as the printers had spread his 95 theses across Germany. And he had realized that their presses could offer him a vast new audience. Martin Luther is said to have been the first person, the first propagandist, the first person to really exploit this new medium. He perceived that he could gain an audience that was far larger than he could have done without it. Luther penned a new text, an address to the Christian nobility of the German nation. With this little pamphlet, Luther would strike a devastating blow at both Pope and Church. His master stroke was to direct it not at the clerics and clergy, but at the secular rulers of Germany. This address to the German nobility suggests that Luther is beginning to see political reality. He's uh, understood that if he's to purify the church, he really has to have the cooperation of those who are in power. In Luther's time, Germany was a patchwork of tiny provinces. Each province was governed by its own local ruler, but they were also held under the overall dominion of the Holy Roman Empire. And individually, these fragmented states did not have the strength to stand up to Rome's ever-increasing financial demands. There was growing resentment inside Germany, and this treatise really sets out to, to say to those in power in Germany, look, this has got to stop. Luther painted a vivid picture of the financial drain that was Rome. German money, in violation of nature, flies over the Alps. He talks about the self-indulgence of the papacy, the numbers of secretaries, thousands of secretaries that the Pope has, the way in which the Pope rides around the city with a veritable train of attendants. And all of this is to suggest that that is what German money is being used for. Luther, in no uncertain terms, was now arguing that the powers of Germany should stand up to Rome and the Pope. It seems to me that the only remedy remaining is for the emperor, the kings and princes to gird themselves with force of arms to attack these pests of the world and fight them, not with words, but with steel. It was a truly radical agenda. Luther was arguing that not just the clergy, but every German had a stake in their church. One of the great themes of this appeal to the German nobility is that it is ordinary people, ordinary Christians, not the priests, ordinary Christians who have a God-given role to play in the running of the church. If we were to use modern ways of speaking, we're talking here about the democratization of religion. But Luther's revolutionary work would have a far more immediate consequence. It would now save him from being handed over to the church for trial and execution. The region of Saxony where Luther lived was ruled by a man named Frederick the Wise. It was Frederick who had founded the University of Wittenberg, where Luther now taught. Frederick began to quietly protect this loudmouth theologian that lay under his rule, refusing to simply hand him over to the agents of the Pope. 
The motives of Friedrich the Wise are something of a mystery. Partly, I think there is a sort of pride about Frederick of Saxony over Luther. He is proud of his learned, famous theologian, the man who is attracting people to his new little university in Wittenberg. Luther's bringing a lot of status and recognition. May not be quite the kind of recognition he's comfortable with, but he is making Wittenberg to be taken seriously. Frederick had also quickly recognized the implications of Luther's latest work. Frederick and his immediate antecedents had been trying to limit the power of the church. Now, Frederick could hear the message of the address to the German nobility and say, this is right. There's a higher principle involved here. I'm not just trying to uh, restrict the funds that are flowing out to Germany because I'm a greedy man. There are higher ideals involved here. But the address to the Christian nobility was attracting attention in even higher circles. In 1520, Frederick received a visit from the most powerful man in Europe, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Charles had only just come to power, but he was already finding Luther a concern. Charles is a devout Catholic. He really intends to preserve the Catholic faith. He is a champion, in some sense, of the papacy, but he's only 19 years old at the time he's elected Holy Roman Emperor. He's really in over his head, and he wants to keep the Luther issue from spinning out of control. Frederick pulled off a diplomatic coup. He convinced Charles that Luther should not be simply handed over to the agents of the church. Instead, he should be allowed to argue his case before Charles himself at his next parliament, or Diet, in the German city of Worms. It was a crucial moment. Frederick had won Luther the chance to present his case at one of the most influential gatherings in Europe. And Luther would not waste this opportunity. I was not trying to gain praise and fame with my writings and little books. For almost everyone I knew condemned my harsh and stinging tone. But I thought that even if the present age condemned me, maybe the judgment of future generations would be better. Leo X's great bull of excommunication was being slowly carried north by a papal emissary. He had been instructed to display it in every town he came to as a warning to anyone who felt sympathy with Luther and his writings. But the further north he traveled, the less support he found. At Erford, where Luther had once studied, the emissary had hundreds of copies of the bull printed. But the university student's response was to throw every copy into the city's river, sarcastically renaming the bull a balloon and saying they wanted to see it float. And all the while, Luther's writings were gathering an ever larger audience. He wrote very well. In fact, he wrote very wittily. In fact, he wrote very rudely. And many people found themselves, you know, fascinated by this man who would use such crude language when arguing with the Pope and with the Church. The Pope should stand up like the stinking sinner he is. If Rome is not a brothel above all brothels, one can imagine, then I do not know what brothel means. 
He's very, very savvy. He's grown up from a very young age among books and writing and bookishness. And he's terrifically good at instinctively sensing what will work for whom. There is such a swarm of vermin yonder in Rome that there was nothing like it in Babylon. The Pope should restrain himself and get his fingers out of the pie. He is an incredible writer. He uses earthy, ordinary language. Uh, he's just fun to read out loud. Uh, he's sarcastic, he's witty, uh, he's profound. He is a great comforter. He's, if you get attacked by Luther, you're just you know, torn up one side and down the other. Printed along with Luther's texts, for those who could not read, were visual parallels. Graphic woodcuts showing the Pope luxuriating in corruption. Even the Pope a servant of Satan. For Luther and his followers were beginning to see the struggle with Rome as an epic battle with the devil himself. Luther is definitely not a modern man. Uh, Luther comes out of the medieval world. He understands the world uh, through the lens of the Bible. He is absolutely convinced that he's dealing with the Antichrist. This is not just Martin Luther versus some politicians. Uh, this was an apocalyptic struggle. Luther now had only a few months until his great showdown before Charles at the Diet of Worms. And Leo's bull of excommunication would reach him before then. He had one further goal, to set down in detail a whole new system of faith and it was this work that turned Luther from a voice of reform into one of outright revolution. It would be named on the Babylonian captivity of the church. If you're going to build, you sometimes have to demolish, and this is a, a work of considerable destructive harshness. Babylon is the city of evil, and the church has been really kidnapped. The church has been taken into Babylon. It's been, it's been, it's, it, it's really been heisted. The church has been taken over, you see, by the, by the crooks. So it's, it's in captivity and it's got to be let out. The church has got to be liberated. Luther now attacked the very heart of the church's power, the system of sacraments. According to the Catholic Church, it was only through these special rituals that a man could hope to achieve salvation and get to heaven. And every one of these seven sacraments, ranging from baptism at birth to the last rites at death, was administered by the church's army of priests. But when Luther turned to scripture, the actual words of the Bible, he could find only two sacraments. Luther argues in the Babylonian captivity of the church that there are really only two sacraments. There's the Lord's Supper and there's baptism. Baptism introduces you into the people of God and the Lord's Supper is a tangible way in which God assures you of faith. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. Luther argued that the remaining sacraments were inventions of the church and they must be cast aside. In one stroke, Luther cut away centuries of ritual and ceremony. And liberated man's relationship with God. The seven sacraments could be seen and were presented as mechanisms by which we rely on clergy uh, to intermediate between us and the divine. And what Luther is saying all along is that that relationship must be one-to-one, -one, unmediated, and direct. You know, we can repent. No one can repent for us. And so the reductionism, on the face of it negative, has this positive feature that it says, really, 
it's so it's it from now on baby it's it's down to you I say that neither Pope nor Bishop nor any ordained man has the right to impose one syllable of law upon the Christian man for all of the faithful are God's priests it redefines the relationship between an individual and God uh, in profound ways because it takes the middleman out. It's like they control the pipes uh, uh, that bring water into your house and suddenly you, you can drill your own well. Uh, you're no longer dependent upon the uh, waterworks of the church. In the winter of 1520, Luther finally received the bull of excommunication from Rome. But it was already too late. With his words, Luther had unleashed a hurricane. You could say that these works are a revolutionary manifesto, not simply for the church, but also for society as well. Luther is saying that ordinary Christians can make a difference, and once people start believing that, then the world can never be the same again. For Luther, the centuries-old power of the Pope now meant nothing. He hurled the bull of excommunication into a bonfire. Because you have corrupted God's truth, may God destroy you in this fire. I am not afraid, and I rejoice to suffer in so noble a cause. In burning the bull of excommunication, he is in fact saying, I will not give in. I am right, you are wrong, come and get me. Luther now braced himself for one final showdown with the powers of the Holy Roman Empire at the Diet of Worms. Twenty-five years ago now, I set out on that journey to Worms, sure that that would be my last day. For, as I declared, if the emperor was inviting me in order for me to recant, then I would never go. But if he was inviting me to my death, then I would gladly come. April the 2nd, 1521, Luther set out from Wittenberg on the two-week journey to Worms. In front rode his escort, Charles V's imperial herald, a guarantee of safe conduct. Luther's friends had done all they could to dissuade him from going convinced he would never return alive. But as he traveled across Germany, Luther now began to glimpse the vast popularity of his cause and works. In Erfurt, the city elders threw a huge party for the passing traveler. In Frankfurt, he was showered with gifts by the city's publishers. He was, after all, one of Europe's most successful authors. The awareness of his popularity might have given him some courage as he proceeded on to Worms, but I do not see in Luther the kind of big head that celebrities often get today. He was more devoted to that principle. He's still a single-minded 
idealist. I think as Luther approaches Worms, he finds himself torn between two emotions. He is genuinely frightened. What is going to happen? Am I going to be safe? And on the other hand, he's realizing that people like him, that he started something that seems to be snowballing. the 16th of April, Luther finally approached the city of Worms. The memory would burn in him until his dying days. On that day, I was greeted by a multitude. The whole city thronged the streets. Escort of knights saw me through the city gates. A priest ran towards me, touched me as if I was a saint. When Luther arrived, the crowds came out to gawk and cheer, and one of the papal representatives reported back to Rome that nine out of ten people were yelling, Long live Luther! and lest the Pope take any satisfaction, the tenth was yelling, death to the Pope. To his last day and beyond, Luther's appearance before the Diet would stand as the pinnacle of his life. The day was hot, but the sun had sunk into a red glow. In that one room were gathered the greatest powers of Europe. The princes of Germany, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles, and the papal nuncio, Johannes Meyer von Eck. These were the men in whom God now entrusted my life. The only person in the room that Luther knew was his own prince, Frederick the Wise. But he knew that it was the votes of everyone here that would decide his fate. The Pope's ambassador had only one demand, that Luther recant every one of his writings. But Luther would remain true to his principles and to his words. We must realize how very frightening this must have been for Luther. Arrayed against him are the forces of church and the forces of the state. And it's clear that they are placing him under huge pressure simply to stand back, to say, no, I shouldn't have done this, I shouldn't have said that. He was shown a pile of his books and asked if they were all his. Indeed, all the books are mine, and I've written more if you want to read them. He would refuse to recant in terms both clear and simple. I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have all contradicted each other. My conscience is captive only to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything. For to go against my conscience is neither right nor safe. Legend tells us that Luther closed his address with one of history's greatest declarations of exhausted defiance. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen.
Luther's statement really marks the dawn of a new era, the era of the ordinary person standing up against authority and saying, I'm sorry, this is what I believe. My conscience tells me this. I cannot do anything else. That, I think, is a defining moment in the emergence of our modern understanding of personal and institutional freedom. This moment in Worms is very powerful. It's a time when a man stood up and spoke the truth and spoke for the truth and spoke for liberty of conscience. And we see him, therefore, as a monument to liberty of conscience. It's one of these grand gestures where an individual stands for something much larger than himself. Luther had been allowed to return to his lodgings after the hearing. He was told he would receive the verdict on the following day. He was sure that he would be handed over to the agents of Rome to face inquisition and trial for heresy. But then he received an extraordinary message. The judges had been unable to come to the unanimous verdict that the rules of the Diet required. One of those abstaining was Luther's old protector, Frederick the Wise. He has perceived the usefulness of Martin Luther. He doesn't want him to die. He wants to go on using him as a kind of weapon against the papacy and the church. And I think he's also very attracted to Luther's teachings, and he genuinely wants Luther to continue his work. Luther was granted safe passage back to Wittenberg from Worms. But the threat of arrest by the powers of the church still hung over him. Frederick now took drastic action. He had Luther snatched on his way back from Worms and hidden away in a remote and isolated castle called the Wartburg, where the agents of the Pope would never find him. Luther goes from the incredible drama and intense experience of the Diet of Worms to a solitary existence hidden away in the Wartburg. He goes from great elation and energy to depression. Luther now found himself sinking into the despair and anguish that had plagued him throughout his early years. A depression that was accompanied by a vivid sense that the devil was haunting him. It may be that in his leisure in the Wartburg, he had more opportunities to confront the devil personally. And when you visit the Wartburg, you are shown the desk where Luther threw ink at the devil. His conviction is that the devil is to be encountered every day. There is now a period of undoubted uh, regression, introspection, melancholy, accompanied by physical symptoms of which Luther was distressingly frank, the return of constipation, heavens knows what. Um, and I think the way that he gets out of this is, 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 to, is to use the Prozac that had worked in the past um, to work. 
Luther threw himself into one of his greatest enterprises yet, a translation of the Bible into German, making the word of God accessible to the common man. But even as Luther languished in isolation, the story of his stand at Worms was spreading like wildfire. He was now a hero, the figurehead of a revolution. Gradually, what started with one man is picked up and repeated, multiplied over and over as more and more individuals become involved. And for them, the Diet of Worms is of symbolic importance and in many ways galvanizes them to act. Suddenly the world shifts. It's like you've taken the pieces and rearranged them and you can't see the world the way it was before. It was in Wittenberg that the first sparks of revolution were lit. Monks and nuns began to leave their monasteries and convents. Priests abandoned church law to get married and live the lives of their congregation. This is a beginning not merely of a religious movement, it's a social, economic, political revolution. There are images of the saints in the churches. The very same people who paid for those images are the one that tear them down and off the walls. It was an unstoppable rebellion and spreading from the grassroots up. The first steps of what would become the Reformation. Luther was finally able to return to Wittenberg in the spring of 1522. By now, the Pope had far greater problems than just one rebellious monk. And Luther was about to discover how much of a revolution his words had inspired. Because the church was so wrapped up in the social conditions of life and the organization of society, the overturning of the status of the church could not fail to have important consequences for society. Communities are able completely to reorganize themselves without reference to these big international structures of the church. And communities across Germany and then across the rest of Europe take hold of issues like social discipline, like the relief of the poor, like public education, and they decide, no, hang on, we don't need to take a lot of other people on board with us. We're just going to decide this at local level and establish local rules for this. Luther's followers had turned Wittenberg upside down. They had seized control of the town's administration confiscated church funds to set up a new welfare system and taken over the schools that were once run by the church. When Luther returns to Wittenberg from his captivity in the Wartburg, he sees the quite radical changes that others have made in his absence. And they were clearly very enthusiastic about these. They believed that this is what Luther wanted to be done. They believed this was the logical outcome of what Luther was saying. But Luther was horrified. Luther's ideas turned out to be much more radical than he realized. Luther had never envisaged change with such speed and such violence. I opposed indulgences and all the papists but never with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Luther climbed the pulpit 
and told the congregation that they must pull back from their social revolution. They should be concerning themselves only with their souls and God. Luther is clearly not in control of the ideas out there in the public domain, but that doesn't mean he doesn't try to call back the genie into the bottle. He's savvy enough to understand that if his ideas become associated with destruction, and destruction of property, then the very secular rulers who were the hope, not only for his personal safety, but also for the reformed world he had in view, would of course turn against it. But for all his appeals to the people of Wittenberg, the spirit of revolution only gathered strength elsewhere. He starts something that then, like a snowball rolling downhill, picks up momentum, uh, bounces over obstacles, goes in a direction that he would not have liked, and just pulverizes uh, the uh, medieval society out of which it came. A series of peasant uprisings flared up across the country. These were inspired by Luther's calls for freedom of faith, but were now seeking social freedom for Germany's peasants. When Luther says you should be free and not subject to the authority of human beings on the matters of faith, it was very easy to see that as an argument that you should be free from your lords if you were serfs. Luther rightly could say he didn't teach that, but history showed that he could be read and understood that way, and he was. Luther rounded on the rebels with some of his most vicious prose. As to the common people, one has to be hard with them and see that under the threat of the sword, they comply with the law, just as you chain up wild beasts. The princes of Germany matched Luther's words with deeds. They slaughtered more than 100,000 of the rebels. Luther's prose is so extreme. Smite, stab, slay. The person who kills a peasant in revolt is the right person to do the deed. He's so extreme that even the elites who are doing the smiting and the stabbing and the slaying are shocked. In Luther's medieval mind, the peasants were as much agents of the devil as the pope. When he dealt with the peasants, he identified them as part of the satanic division. Uh, they were not merely human beings. They were minions of Satan. They were doing demonic work. And as such, he, as a representative of the Church of Christ, had to attack them with all the vigor at his command. Luther would always hold to this vision of apocalyptic, biblical conflict, lashing out at anyone who threatened his idea of the road to salvation. After the peasants, one of his most infamous targets would be Judaism. Be on your guard against the Jews, knowing that wherever they have their synagogues, nothing is found but a den of devils in which sheer self-glory, conceit, lies, blasphemy, and defaming of God are practiced. You never get half pints. You always get court jugs with Luther. You know, when he's warm, he is wonderfully warm. When he's hateful, he is very hateful indeed. The torrent of reform that Luther had unleashed remained unstoppable. This movement, known as Protestantism, swept across Germany and then onto France, the Netherlands, Belgium. But in every place, it took a different form. In Geneva, 
John Calvin founded a community where everyone had to live by rules based on the strictest of religious ideals. Citizens would be fined even for missing a sermon. In England, it would take a bloody civil war before Cromwell could establish his vision of a Protestant state. And then in the newly discovered territories of America, the Pilgrim Fathers would found a nation on Luther's principles of religious freedom. Luther's ideas in the specific historic moment when they emerged and the reception they received meant an extraordinary change for the conception of what Europe is. It's no longer one Christian Europe. Moreover, it becomes a global story. It becomes a story that affects Asia and later Africa and the Americas and so on. It's absolutely part of the heritage of the European, Western, I would say, of the whole world. But Luther would never again leave his own province of Germany. He did find some peace. He married an ex-nun named Catherine, and they had a large family together. And always, Luther continued to write. Luther's story just reminds us of the power of individual charisma. Charisma, both the person standing up and talking, but even charisma that can travel on the page, on the written page. You never can sort of just like the guy. Luther is this elementary force embodied in language, uh, offering a vision of salvation which is liberating, uh, which resonates, which seems real to so many people. And almost once you see it that way, you can't see the world differently. Luther is uh, irrepressible. He's outrageous. He's witty. He's very funny. But he remains in our imaginations as someone who is highly relevant for insisting on being devoted to principle and to speaking out. The emphasis on the individual the courage of the individual and the willingness of the individual to undergo death for his profession, for his beliefs. And in this way, Luther has to be ranked with the great emancipators of human history. Luther would finally die in the year 1546, seized by a crippling heart attack after a harsh winter journey to the town of his birth, Eisleben. He had held on to his sense of rage and his ear for a good phrase until the very end. When I die, I want to be a ghost so I can continue to pester the bishops, priests, and godless monks until they have more trouble with a dead Luther than they could have had before with a thousand living ones. 